Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Hey, thanks for joining me this morning. We're going to be looking at the call of one of Jesus' disciples, a call that probably made some of the others uh, a little suspicious, maybe even upset that Jesus would call someone like this to follow him. Well, hey, what about you and me? Well, we'll look at that here in just a moment as we go over to Luke chapter 5, then eventually back to Matthew chapter 9. This story is also recorded in the second chapter of Mark, almost identical to Luke's version, but we're going to be getting into some wonderful truths of Scripture this morning. In the meantime, I do want to say thank you to everyone that has mentioned something about an, an unusual anniversary in my life. I'm excited to have just celebrated 45 years in ministry. I brought my ordination certificate home, and no, I'm not going to show it to you, but I was looking at the names on that from... July the 22nd, 1979. Most all of those people have gone on to be with the Lord. Not you, Gary Morris. Thank you for the impact you had in my life during those days. But as I read those names, there were just some wonderful memories of some men who had a great impact on me as a young preacher who had just been called and hardly knew what he was getting into. And it's mentors like that and folks that just love you, even though you don't even understand why they're pouring into your life, but they do. Uh, it's people like that that really make a difference in the long run. Well, that's what Jesus is doing with his disciples. He's mentoring them. He is teaching them the way of ministry. He's opening scriptural truths to them. And we have the call of one of those disciples recorded for us next in Luke chapter 5, where we're going to focus on to begin with, and then we're going to a very important part of this story that Matthew gives us that I think really puts the cap on it this morning. So as we look at Luke 5 verse 27, it says, After this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi, or Matthew, sitting at the tax office. He said to him, Follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Now, is it that Jesus as a stranger just walks by and Matthew's never seen him before and he gets up to follow this guy that just says, follow me? No, there's, there's no doubt that because of the reputation of Jesus and perhaps the fact that maybe Matthew has even been present listening to the teaching of Jesus at one time or the other, that he already knows who he is. And he is anxious to follow the instructions of the Messiah. He is perhaps thrilled that the Messiah would call him and say, follow me. And he doesn't hesitate to quit his job right there on the spot and say, I'm going with this guy. Well, in all of his excitement, it seems that Matthew's ready to throw a party. He wants to introduce his friends to the Messiah and that's where we pick up in verse 29. It says, Then Levi hosted a grand banquet. Now, the adjective grand on the word banquet, not just a meal. There are other ways throughout the New Testament you could have said, hey, you know, we're going to have a little luncheon over here at the house. It's just a little, little casual thing. No, it says he threw a grand banquet for him at his house. Now, hang on for just a minute. Remember, Matthew is a tax collector. Tax collectors were not appreciated in Israel at the time because the occupying force, the Romans, were these, these folks were using Jewish citizens to collect taxes for them. And a part of that routine was just here's how much we need to be collected and whatever you collect over that, that's kind of your pay, your bonus. And so many of these guys were well off because they were skimming from their own people. And so tax collectors were looked, looked upon as some of the scum of the society. Traitors. Traitors to the Roman authorities. So it's apparent that Matthew has perhaps benefited from this arrangement as well. He, he apparently has a house large enough to host a grand banquet. So Matthew's probably... I don't know that he's filthy rich like some of them, probably not as rich as Zacchaeus, who we'll see later on in the story, but at least he's uh, in good enough standing financially that he's able to host this grand banquet at his house. 
Now, who do you think he's going to invite to this banquet? Well, the people he knows. Well, we're going to find out who those people are here in just a minute. It says, now there were a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining at the table with them. Well, I mean, same thing. The same thing with everyone who has a vocation. If you're a plumber, you know other plumbers. If you're in the grocery business, you probably know other people that work at grocery stores. If you're a teacher, you know other teachers, so folks that hang out in the school and in the union and whatever. And this is the way it is with Matthew. He's a tax collector. He knows other tax collectors. And he knows, apparently, a host of other sinners because it says in verse 30, the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Well, Jesus replied to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, now, when Matthew covers this, I think it's quite interesting that uh, of course, anytime you read someone in first century language from this part of the world and they're talking about themselves, they'll never do so in the first person. They will always do it in the third person, as if an entirely different person is writing the account. And so here's Matthew writing about himself, saying in Matthew 9, 9, that as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him, exactly what the other two gospel accounts say. And while he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Once again, Jesus replies in almost the exact same language as Luke, when he heard this, verse 12, he said, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. But hang on. It is Matthew who remembered something else by virtue of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that Jesus told the people there that I think is most significant that you might miss. Verse 13 Go and learn what this means. Again, this is Jesus addressing those Pharisees who were concerned that there were tax collectors and sinners at Matthew's house. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Here is Jesus quoting the Old Testament yet again. Jesus had a very high view of Scripture. Quite often, to make his point, he would quote Scripture, which, of course, he had memorized and in his heart, here he is quoting from Hosea and saying, here's what God says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what is Jesus doing? He's once again calling on the authority of Scripture to put into context what he is doing. He's doing something that you and I have been trained to do or told to do when it comes to problems we may have with the passage of Scripture. Always let Scripture explain Scripture. You can always put it in context by pulling together other passages, following those references, and see what the Bible says. You'll discover there are no contradictions, only confirmations of what God is trying to get across. What is it Jesus was trying to say? I'm on a mission. And my mission is not to come and impress you religious people, you folks that think you are so special because you know Judaism from one end to the other. No, that's not my job. My job is to prov provide redemption for everyone. And once again, remember, it was Jesus who said, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That whoever covers an awful lot of space, an awful lot of people, an awful lot of sinners. And over and over again, we're going to see this theme from Jesus calling people who these religious folks don't think are worthy to be in the kingdom of God, Jesus calls them to repentance. Yes, turn around, change your life, let me have my way, and let God be God in your life. It's not too late as long as you can hear my voice and respond to my call. Well, friends, that call is still going out even today. 
And regardless of where you are in your life, how much you think you've messed up, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, our Lord is still calling you to repentance even today. His arms are open wide. His invitation is clear. Come to me, all you who are weak and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You have a great day, and the Lord will see you again right here tomorrow when we wake up in his word.